So I hand over. Thank you very much for being here, and we are excited to hear your talk. <clears throat> so some requests for you. First, if you take a photo of me, please do not put it in Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp. I see it agrees. <laughs> that company is a surveillance engine. It uses face recognition. It can even recognize people by the back of their heads. So if you put a photo in that company that shows other people, you are helping it to track those people. That's ba a bad way to treat your friends, and it's a bad way to treat me. Please do not do that to me. <clears throat> also, if you take a photo with a mobile device, make sure that geolocation is turned off, that it is not putting the geolocation into the photos. <clears throat> Check that explicitly before you take the photo. <clears throat> Second, if you want to distribute recordings of this talk, please do so solely in the formats that are favorable to free software. That includes both audios and videos. These include the OGG formats and the WebM format. They do not include MP anything. Please don't distribute in those formats <clears throat> because they're patented in some countries. Please especially do not distribute in Flash because <laughs> Flash requires a proprietary player that is malware <laughs> and you shouldn't install it. By the way, that's not an exaggeration. It's not just a, a silly insult. It's a factual statement. I'll tell you more later. Uh, and <clears throat> it, you should always complain to any website that has Flash. And please don't distribute in Windows Media Player, Real Player, or QuickTime. In addition, please make sure that the distribution site in normal access permits downloading a copy of the recording without running any non-free software, including non-free JavaScript code sent in the page itself. And finally, please, uh, please put on it the Creative Commons no derivatives license because this is a presentation of a point of view. So I'm going to talk about several threats to our freedom in the digital society. You'll come across many projects that say they're going to help humanity through digital inclusion or closing the digital divide. They presume, without question, that participation in a digital society is good. Well, I don't agree. I think that participation in a digital society can be good or bad, depending on whether that society is just or unjust. If digital society becomes unremittingly unjust and we can't fight that, then our goal should be digital extraction from that digital society. And we're getting pretty close to that point. So I'm going to talk about various threats to our freedom in the digital society, starting with software that the users do not control. In other words, software that is not free. The first point is, by free software, I mean libre, not gratuit. It's frei, not kostenlos. Whether you pay to get a copy of a program is a minor practical detail. We're not particularly concerned with that either way. We have nothing against either way. What concerns us is not how you get the copy, but what you get when you get the copy. Does it respect your freedom or does it attack your freedom? First, what's a program? What's a computer? A computer 
is a universal digital engine. And conceptually, it's very simple. All it knows how to do is get the next instruction and carry it out, and get the next and carry it out, and get the next and carry it out. And it does this over and over millions of times a second. The instructions come from the program. Depending on what the program says, you can make the same computer do anything. Well, not quite anything. Some things are still impossible. But aside from them, it'll do whatever the program tells it, whatever the instructions tell it to do. So who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you when really it's someone else. <laughs> you might think your computer obeys you when really it's obeying someone else first and it serves you as much as the real master permits while betraying you when the real master wishes. With a program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. There's no other way, so it's always one or the other. When the users control the program, we call that free software because it respects users' freedom. What is freedom? It's having control of your own life, having control of the activities you do in your life. But if you use a program to do an activity, control of that activity requires control of the program you do it with. So the programs that respect your freedom that respect users' freedom more generally are the programs under users' control. That requires four essential freedoms. <clears throat> freedom zero is to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is to study the program and change it so it functions as you wish, so it does your activities the way you wish. Practically speaking, this requires having access to the source code. Here's some source code. It looks like a combination of math and English. If you know programming and you know that programming language, you can understand what that means and you can change it to do something else. To run the program, we convert it into an executable, which is a bunch of ones and zeros that's hard to make any sense of. Well, if it's this small, you could figure out what it does. But when a large program of hundreds of thousands of lines is converted into an executable, figuring out what that executable means is terribly hard. It's known as reverse engineering. <clears throat> and it's an extremely hard thing to do. So if we said to people, you're permitted to change the program, you just have to reverse engineer it first, this would be a, a dishonest sleaze. Uh, people would not in practice be free to change it. So freedom one requires access to the source code. These two freedoms give us separate control over the program, meaning I'm free to change my copies and you're free to change your copies and you're free to change your copies. But we're limited to doing this in isolation. That's essential. That much freedom is essential, but it's not sufficient because most users don't know how to program. They don't understand source code, and maybe they don't want to. They do other things. So how can they participate in exercising control over what the program does? We need collective control, which means you're free to work with others in exercising control over that program. Can somebody open a, a door or window over there so we can get some air over there? Can they be opened, please? Uh, it's getting hot in here. So <clears throat> Windows <clears throat> does do occasionally have a use. So here we see a group of three users working together to make the program do what they want. Two of them are directly changing the program. They must know how, obviously. 
the third one on the left is not changing the program. Maybe he's a non-programmer. But even though he can't change the program himself, he can participate in a group deciding what changes to make. And in this way, participates in control of the program. <clears throat> The people who work together are those who choose to work together. You don't have to work with others, but you're free to. <clears throat> so here are two other users that are not working with those three. They're using the program separately. They have the standard version, I guess. Why don't they work together? We don't know. Maybe they don't like each other. Maybe they never heard of each other. Maybe tomorrow they'll start working together. If they all wish to do so, they're free to do so. <clears throat> or they're, and they're also free to keep using it separately or join with some other group. Collective control requires two more freedoms. Freedom two, to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three, to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. <clears throat> These two freedoms make collective control possible because they permit those in the group to work together. One in the group who changes the program can use freedom three to make more copies of that version and distribute them to others in the group. Then. Uh, Others who got it can use freedom too to make more copies and distribute them to other people in the group until they all have them. They're also free to offer copies to others. They can even publish them and offer them to the general public. Freedom too includes both giving and selling copies. It includes both non-commercial and commercial redistribution. But one part of it, which is non-commercial redistribution of exact copies, has a special moral importance because that is sharing. Sharing creates a community. Sharing is the most basic way to cooperate with the rest of society. Any attempt to stop people from sharing copies is an attack on society that we must not tolerate. <clears throat> However, for a work to be free is a lot more than just being allowed to share copies. It includes commercial redistribution with or without changes. That's what Freedom 2 and Freedom 3 give us all. Non, it includes commercial as well as non-commercial redistribution. So when a program gives us these four freedoms completely and thoroughly, then it's free software, which means the users control the program, <clears throat> the users generally make it do what they want it to do, and the program respects our freedom. That's what free software means. But if one of these freedoms is missing or incomplete, then we don't control the program. Instead, the program controls the users and someone else controls the program. This is what a proprietary program does. It's an instrument of unjust power. Power for the program's owner over its users. It's a scheme to subjugate people. This is why proprietary software, proprietary means non-free, is an injustice. Without exception, it's an injustice. This is enough reason to reject non-free software and try to get rid of it all. But it's worse. This is how bad it was 30 years ago. Now it's much worse. Because nowadays, the developer or owner is fully aware of this power and is constantly tempted to use it to hurt the users for his own benefit. Benefit at the expense of his own users. They do this by putting in malicious functionalities. <clears throat> Non-free software is very commonly malware. 
because it's designed to do nasty things to the user. I'm not talking about errors here. Everybody makes mistakes, but these are intentional. They are not mistakes. For instance, they spy on the user. This example is the Amazon Swindle, Amazon's ebook reader, which spies on the user. Every so often it sends the title of the book being read and the page number to Amazon. If the user enters any notes, sent to Amazon. If the user highlights anything, sent to Amazon. Totally surveilled reading. And even if the book was obtained somewhere other than Amazon, Amazon still knows the user is reading it. We know of spy f facilities in, uh, in Windows, in Mac OS, in the iThings, in Flash Player. I told you Flash Player was malware. And in nearly all portable phones. They're required by law in some countries to send the GPS location on remote command. The user can't stop it. But then it gets worse. There's the functionality of restricting users, stopping users from doing things. I'm not talking about a missing feature. Sure, there are always missing features. Nobody has an infinite amount of time. If you're developing a free program and you stop and someone says, hey, why didn't you add this feature? You can say, I got tired, you add it. Please add it. That's a legitimate response. Why should he be obligated to do all the work? You should do some. If you want it done, do it. Of course, the proprietary developer can't make that response because the proprietary developer is not letting us add features. So if a proprietary developer left one out <coughs> and the users say, we want this feature, the proprietary developer is not saying, you add it. The proprietary set developer is saying, I, did, I stopped and you're stuck. And that is bad, but the, the wrong there is making the program proprietary. But here it's worse. Here I'm not talking about just leaving out a feature. Here I'm t what they do is they work for years figuring out how to design their things, design their products so that the, what users want is impossible. They intentionally stop users from doing things such as viewing the work or distributing a copy. This is known as Digital Restrictions Management, or DRM. It's the malicious functionality of stopping users from doing what they want to do. It can only be done with proprietary software. In free software, the users would be free to add the feature. So this is the uh, notorious blue ray that attacks users who want to share. This is a little humoristic. It doesn't shine a ray at them. It simply stops them from, from making a copy. Uh, the contents of a Blu-ray disc are encrypted in a secret way, and we don't have free software that can even read them at all. The result is every Blu-ray disc is the enemy of your freedom. If you value your freedom, don't give it away. Don't hand it to somebody who's offering you a Blu-ray disc. I have never used a Blu-ray disc. I expect I never will, unless somebody develops free software I can do it with. Then there would be no reason to refrain. We know of these uh, digital restrictions management features in Windows, in Mac OS, in iOS, in Flash Player and in the Amazon Swindle. But it gets worse. There are also back doors that allow someone to attack the user. Sending a command remotely telling the, the system to do something to the user without asking the user for permission and it can be a nasty thing. For instance, the Amazon Swindle has a back door for erasing books. So it's not just Orwellian surveillance, it's or Orwellian virtual book burning. 
We know about this by observation. In 2009, Amazon, in an Orwellian act, erased thousands of copies of a particular book. Can you guess which book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. Somebody came to a talk once and told me <clears throat> after he had seen the book disappear while he was in the middle of reading it. <clears throat> there was a lot of criticism, so Amazon promised it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. <laughs> right. Not a very comforting promise, is it? But actually, it was a phony promise. Amazon didn't intend to keep that promise. It just said that to make the opposition quiet down. And by the time people discovered Amazon was once again arbitrarily erasing books without even a command from the state, uh, it was too late to recover the momentum. Then there's censorship. Apple pioneered censorship of apps. The iPhone, and followed by other iThings, won't install, won't let users freely install apps as of their choice. It will only install apps approved by Apple from the App Store. <clears throat> Apple practices this censorship arbitrarily based on its commercial advantages and its political preferences. For instance, people noticed that apps that would provide real information about where to get an abortion were not permitted. But the crisis pregnancy centers, as they call themselves, whose purpose is to mislead women <coughs> and tell them that abortions are horribly dangerous and refuse to tell them where to get one, they were permitted to post their apps in Apple's store. When users found ways to defeat the censorship, they called it jailbreaking. Thus, they recognized that these computers were designed as jails for their users, and that's our term for a computer that censors application installation. They're jails. Microsoft followed the same policy with Windows mobile devices. They're jails, too. Uh, then there's sabotage. Sony originally sold the PlayStation 3 with two modes of use playing games on the gaming network and running another system such as GNU slash Linux. Then somebody figured out a way to break Sony's digital restrictions management using GNU slash Linux on the PlayStation. So Sony decided to take away that mode of use. It issued <coughs> a firmware downgrade saying, if you install this downgrade, you will no longer be able to run GNU slash Linux. But if you don't install the downgrade, you won't be able to play on the gaming network. So every user had to give up one mode of use or the other, a form of sabotage. But sabotage can be more direct. Sometimes the product has a universal backdoor. A universal backdoor is one that can be used to remotely change the software, which means it can be used to do absolutely any nasty thing to that user. No limits. <clears throat> There's been one in Windows, X, Windows since Windows XP. Microsoft did not admit it, but people proved it was there. And to show how ethical standards are going down, in Windows 10, there's still a universal backdoor, but now Microsoft says so openly. Now Microsoft does not fear revulsion from the users. They're too downtrodden. They won't rebel against anything. They believe they are, they ha that resistance is useless. Of course, that's not true, as some of us prove every day, but many people think it is. They haven't got the courage, and Microsoft knows it. Universal backdoors are known in, uh, also in the Amazon swindle and nearly all portable phones. And uh, 
Android has something a little like a universal backdoor. It has a backdoor that can forcibly install or deinstall any app. So Google could make an app specially for you and force install it. An Android expert told me that that's not quite equivalent to a universal backdoor, but it's clearly pretty powerful. And there's another kind of sabotage. Microsoft, when it finds out about security bugs in Windows, first shows them to the NSA and then fixes them. The article I read was entitled, Can Anyone Ever Trust Microsoft Again? The answer is obvious, they couldn't trust Microsoft before. <laughs> Do you think the Swiss government should run Windows? So, now we know we, M Microsoft does this. We don't know whether other companies do this for the US government or some other government. How could we tell, right? It's only luck that we ever find out. So basically, I've demonstrated that people who use proprietary software are in general already being dragged behind the bus. Uh, <clears throat> We have dozens more examples of proprietary malware. Look in gnu.org slash proprietary for organized lists of examples with references in the press. We're not speculating here. But these few examples are enough to prove that most users of proprietary software are victims of proprietary malware. Most discussions of malware are strangely one-sided. They only talk about the viruses and their malicious functionalities. They don't talk about the malicious functionalities designed into the products, so we do talk about that. You've got to expect proprietary software to be malware. And why do they do it? It's not just that they're sadists. No, they have found ways to profit by mistreating their own users. And you can never be sure that they're not doing so. Sometimes we know a proprietary program is malware. Sometimes we don't know, which means it's possible malware. But we can never verify it isn't malware. There's no way to do that. So every proprietary program is either known malware or possible malware. You can never have a rational trust for a proprietary program. Only blind faith, often in a company that has mistreated people so many times already <clears throat> that only a fool could have faith in it. And <clears throat> what that means is you should never trust a proprietary program. Never. The only way you can have a rational trust in a program is if it's free, because then the users have control of the program. If there's something nasty in it, the users have a chance to find it, and then they're free to fix it. So the only known defense against malware is free software. It's not a perfect defense. Nothing guarantees that users will find something malicious, but they can, and the harder they organize to look, the better their chances are, whereas the users of a proprietary program can't check the source code to look, and even if they find out about malware, they still can't fix it. I've told you about various examples. The users have not fixed most of those examples because there's no way to fix them. They can't fix anything, it's proprietary software. <clears throat> Not only that, but why do they put in so much malware? Because they know about their power and the power corrupts them. They're tempted to take advantage of that power to shaft their own users, so they do. But we developers of free software do not have power over the users and we know that. So we are safe from the temptation, safe because we don't have power. And the proprietary developers have no shame now. 
They even have events where they give talks about their clever new methods of snooping on and taking advantage of users. You can only expect the worst from them. So you've got to escape and come to the free world that we have built. We built the free world with the GNU operating system plus Linux the kernel. I started in 1984 to develop a complete free operating system called GNU. I wanted to make it possible to use a computer in freedom. The computer needs an operating system, so using the computer in freedom needs a free operating system, and there was none. But I was an operating system developer, <clears throat> and I felt confident that I would be able to get a complete free operating system developed. And that's what GNU is. GNU was completed in 1992. At that point, we had almost all of the initial GNU system, but one essential component was missing. That was the kernel. In February 1992, Mr. Torvalds, who had developed a kernel called Linux, which was proprietary, in, it was proprietary in 1991, but in 92, he liberated it. He re-released it as free software. At that point, Linux filled the last gap in GNU, producing a complete system that was basically the GNU system, but also contained Linux. It's the GNU slash Linux system. Now, as you've seen, many users refer to this system as Linux. They give all the credit to Mr. Torvalds and none to us which is not really fair because we started earlier and we did more and we're the ones who had this goal. Torvalds didn't want to develop a complete free operating system. It was not his goal. But we had been working towards that goal for most of a decade and we got most of the way there already. <clears throat> so when he took the last step, it got us to the destination. So please, when you're talking about this system, please call it GNU slash Linux. Please give us equal mention. And please don't use a penguin without a GNU. <laughs> the penguin is only the symbol of Linux, and Linux is only one of the important components of the system. please give us equal mention and call it GNU slash Linux or GNU plus Linux. Anyway, GNU slash Linux is basically a free operating system, but when you look at the details, that's not always so in practice. And the reason is people have made many different variants of GNU slash Linux, and they typically do that by adding other programs, and sometimes those are not free. When they add a non-free program, they make a, comp a collection that isn't free. <clears throat> An operating system is a collection of programs, typically now thousands of programs. In order for a collection of programs to be free, every program in the collection must be free, without exception. If there's one non-free program, well, it takes away users' freedom, and the collection that contains it <clears throat> takes away users' freedom because that one thing in it is taking away users' freedom. So once they add a non-free program into the system, the system no longer is freedom respecting. Sad to say, there are over a thousand distros, as they're called, and almost all of them contain non-free software. There are just a few that are free. You can find the list in gnu.org slash distros. Oh, I think we need that door open for air circulation. I see the drapes are not moving much. There's, we're not getting air circulation. Would someone please open those doors again? <clears throat> <clears throat> so what's the problem of the non-free distros? One problem is you install those and you think you've 
got to freedom and you got most of the way there, but not all the way. There's still non-free software in your computer. It's a lot better than running Windows or Mac OS, but it hasn't got all the way there. So do choose a free distro. But there's a bigger problem from the non-free distros. Some of them are very popular and they have a lot of influence on people's thinking. And they use that influence in ways that teaches people not to care much about freedom. And that weakens our, our movement. If we're going to win freedom, we're going to have to push, we're going to have to demand freedom. If we forget about it, we'll never get there, except by drifting there. Look, for instance, at Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a non-free distro, which is very widely known. And When you look at, and its statements, what it, Ubuntu can, communicates to the users is very influential. And what does it say? It could say, you deserve freedom in your computing and you won't get it from us. <laughs> of course, that's not what it says. Instead it says, we th believe we give you the best possible user experience. How do you teach values? By basing your words and your actions on those values. Well, their words and their actions are based on valuing only convenience, not freedom and community. So they're teaching people to value only convenience. And that works against exactly what we need most. So it's very important not to praise non-free distros. Once you've installed a free distro so that you only have free software in your computer, uh, or at least in your operating system, there's still a chance you'll end up running non-free software as you browse the web. Many web pages contain programs. They can be free or non-free, and some of them are free, but most of them are non-free. <clears throat> These programs are written in the JavaScript language, so we, we can refer to them by talking about JavaScript programs. But really the point is that they come into your machine on a web page and your browser installs them and runs them and doesn't even tell you. So to protect ourselves, we developed LibreJS. It's an add-on for Firefox that checks every JavaScript program to see if it's either trivial or free. In those cases, the pro JavaScript program is permitted to run. But if it's non-trivial and non-free, LibreJS blocks it and warns you. You can see on the screen whether there are non-free JavaScript programs there. And It does one other useful thing. If you've ever tried to complain to the webmasters, you know the hardest part is seeing where and how to send the complaint. LibreJS finds that for you heuristically. So you can complain just by clicking. And all you have to do is type in, I couldn't r use your site because it demanded I run a non-free JavaScript program. Please fix that. Send. In less than a minute, you can complain. You could complain to 10 different sites in 10 minutes a day. Please do it. It's contributing to the movement. We need to show those webmasters they're losing something by not respecting our freedom. Another way to lose your freedom is by letting a service do your computing. The Customary way to do a computing job, a computing task, is run a program. And if the program is free, the users control it. You can lose control by running a non-free program. Well, now there's another way, but it's a mistaken way. If you entrust that computing job to somebody else's server, you can't possibly have any control over it. You see, a program is a work. It exists in copies. 
you can have a copy of the program if someone lets you, and then you can run it, and then you can have control over it. <clears throat> but there aren't copies of a service. You can't copy a service. You never have control over a service run by someone else. He has control over it, and you don't. So if you use a service to do your own computing activity, you've lost control over it. Basically, never replace a program with a service. Never. If you can do the job in your own computer, that's the only way that lets you have control. If you hand over that same computing activity to somebody else's server, you don't have control anymore. And there's no remedy. There's no way that we can all have control over what that server is doing. The only way each of us can have control is if we have our own copies. Then I can change my copy the way I wish, and you can change your copy the way you wish. But if we're all using that server, it works a certain way. There's no way I can have what I want and you can have what you want. So basically, you've got to reject this scenario. You must not use a service as a substitute for a program. So we call it service as a software substitute or SaaS. And for your freedom's sake, you need to reject it. This doesn't apply to all services. It applies to services that offer to do your computing. Because there are other computing activities you do which are communicating with others. They're joint activities, communication activities, and you can't have full control over them because of their nature. They're not simply yours. In those cases, we need to go through the network, and if a network, if, if that includes using a server in the network, it doesn't make things any worse. So we have to distinguish between your own computing and your joint activities with others. Joint activities with others may need a server, but if it's your own computing, in principle you can do that by running a program in your own computer, and any other way is denying you control over your computing. In fact, using SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program. You lose control of your computing just the same. By both pathways, you get to the same bad result. But actually, SAS is even worse. I told you that many proprietary programs spy on their users. <clears throat> well, that means they send data to a server. With SAS, the user has to send all the pertinent data to a server at the beginning in order to do the job. So it's the same result. There's a server which has that user's data. But it's even worse. I told you that some proprietary programs have a universal backdoor. Someone has the power to change how the, to use that to change the code and thus change how the user's computing is done without asking permission to change it. With SAS, the server owner can install different software in the server at any time and thus change how it does user's computing. Now, <clears throat> it's right that this owner can install different software in the computer. It's his computer. He should be able to change what it's doing. The problem comes from the fact that what it's doing is not his computing, it's other people's computing. So he has the power to change how their computing is done without asking each of them for permission to change it. So SAS is by its structure equivalent to running a proprietary program which is spyware and has a universal backdoor. It's equivalent to malware, so don't use SAS. <clears throat> we want to have computing in freedom, but there are obstacles to cross. For instance, the companies that get money by subjugating users use that money to make it hard to escape. They create social inertia. 
For instance, when Microsoft got uh, the companies that sell PCs to pay for a Windows license on every machine and ship every machine with Windows, the result was an additional obstacle against ever moving away from Windows. <clears throat> when Apple uh, offers a discount on computers to a school, it's, trying to, it's doing that to try to create inertia, making it hard for society to move away from Apple machines. So every time these companies appear, we should protest them. <clears throat> if they're selling, if they're recruiting, protest them. <clears throat> Another obstacle is the term open source. You see how, how I object to trying to piggyback promotion of open source on my activities. I'm very firm about that because open source is a different idea, which I have never supported. <clears throat> Anyone who's told you that I do open source is giving you misinformation about me. I started the free software movement in 1983. It's about giving users freedom. Open source was started in 1998 as a reaction against the ethical ideals of the free software movement. People in the free software community disagreed. They had different views. Some were those of, some were we supporters of the free software movement. And there were others who disagreed and they didn't want to look at this as a matter of right and wrong, but they did like and participate in development and promotion of use of free software. So we had diff we had, since we had a disagreement, we debated with each other over years. And then in 1998, they coined a different term, open source, so that they could talk about the same community and the same software and without ever mentioning our ideals. It was a way to disconnect our achievements from our th philosophy so that they could promote the achievements and have the philosophy be hidden and buried. <clears throat> because they had a different term, they could create, they could de design a different discourse. They left out all the ethical foundation of free software and talked only about practical aspects and they presented only practical benefits as the reasons. So they presented it as only a way of doing things that you could do if you like. But they never said you should. That's what they don't want to say. Our criticism of proprietary software saying that this common business method is an injustice, for them was too radical. They wanted to win the favor of business executives by not saying things like that. So where we say if you develop and distribute a program, it's your moral duty to respect users' freedom to change and redistribute it, they say only it might be in your interest practically to let users change and redistribute it because they'll improve the code quality. Open source is not a movement. That was their choice, not to be a movement. Open source is not based on principles. That was their choice, not to make it a matter of principles. It's just a recommendation for them. But they had the support of the majority in 1998 and nearly all the businesses. So the politicians and the mass media mostly followed the businesses. And since then, they only talk about open source. It's hard for us to make ourselves known to the public at all. In fact, every, most of the people who've heard of me think I support open source. Every week I get several messages thanking me for what I've contributed to open source or asking me to discuss some aspect of that and I have to refuse. I have to say, I don't want to talk about any issues about open source. That's not what I support. 
and never was. Or I didn't contribute anything to open source, so there's been misinformation. I have to respond in a way that's sharp enough that the person recognizes that it does a double take and realizes he was mistaken in what he had been told before, but I have to avoid making it so sharp that the person's feelings are hurt. It's a difficult balance. Even worse, I see articles that call me the founder of, the father of open source. <laughs> so I, I sent a letter saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> then I present the name and the ideas of free software, and that's the real point of the letter, to show the readers of that periodical the ideas that were not in the article. But I like to start with a joke. It's always fun. So that means you can help us just by saying free software or freie software or logiciel libre and not talking about open or closed. And it's especially important when you're in a discussion when others who are talking about open or closed because then by your firmness you can make sure that all the lurkers in that discussion see that it should be an issue of freedom, even if many don't think so. At least you'll show that there are some who do value freedom and believe decisions should be made based on freedom. <clears throat> this is a very important way to help us. In fact, if you want to make the best possible contribution to the free software movement, le learn to give speeches like this. That's what we need more than anything else. Another obstacle is when hardware is secret. They'll sell you the product and they refuse to tell you how to control it. Instead they say, here's a proprietary program that will control this device. Run it and shut up. We can't run this proprietary program, it would deny our freedom. So what do we have to do? Reverse engineering. Somebody has to figure out how to, that device is being controlled and write that down. Then someone else can write the free program to do the job. So uh, if you want to make a very big technical contribution, this is what you should do. And this university should teach reverse engineering too should have a class in reverse engineering aimed especially at figuring out how to control a device. Uh, it's a lucrative technical career, it ought to be taught, and it's also exactly the work that's needed for us to make progress in that particular theater. Speaking of schools, schools should teach only free software and they should teach why they teach only free software. They should explain the civic reasons for this because the school has a mission to educate good citizens of a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. In computing, that means uh, training people to be good at using free software so they're ready to live in a free digital society. Teaching a proprietary program is teaching dependence. Giving the children proprietary software is like giving them tobacco. They're both wrong. They shouldn't do either of those. <clears throat> then there is teaching children to be helpful, cooperative citizens who help other people. So every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring proprietary software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must, so if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies including software, sorry, including source code 
with the rest of the class because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. Therefore, you may not bring proprietary software to class except for reverse engineering. <laughs> the school, to set a good example, must follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and share copies, including source, with everyone that wants copies, except for reverse engineering exercises, if any, it should only share the source of those once people have submitted their answers. But there's also the issue of education in computing. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's proprietary, that knowledge is secret, withheld from the students. A proprietary program is the enemy of the spirit of education, so it should not be tolerated in a school except for reverse engineering to discover that knowledge. But a free program makes its knowledge available to the students. It supports the, the spirit of education, and it's necessary for education. How do you learn to write good, clear code? By reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Only free software offers the chance to read the code of large programs we really use. Then you have to write lots of code. If you want to learn to write clear code in large programs, you have to write lots of code in large programs. But to do that, you have to start small. What does it mean to start small writing code for large programs? It means writing small changes in existing large programs. Only free software gives you the chance to write changes in large programs we really use. Any school can offer its students the chance to master the craft of programming if it's a free software school. And, well, first I will mention that uh, <clears throat> governments also must move to free software. Uh, in the case of a state agency, the use of a non-free program attacks the computational sovereignty of the country. Government agencies do their computing for the people, and they have a duty, a responsibility, to maintain full control over that computing so they can make sure they're doing their duty to the people correctly. To use a non-free program or to use SAS is a failure of that responsibility, it is a grave problem. And of course, since the proprietary software is likely to be malware and might have spy functionalities or a backdoor, of course, when it's done in certain critical functions, it threatens national security. So the government must move away from proprietary software with dispatch. It must make a plan to put an end to the use of proprietary software in any state entity. Although this will take time, of course, don't put it off. Make sure that you migrate in a matter of years rather than make a plan to migrate over a period of centuries. Look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash government free software dot html for various specific measures proposed to move state agencies to free software. Human rights depend on each other, and if we lose one, it becomes hard to defend the others. Now that we use computing for so many important activities, Free software, that is, control of our computing, has become one of, the one of the human rights we must maintain in order to protect the others. And that requires a sacrifice sometimes. <clears throat> of course, we know from Swiss history that the Swiss had to fight for their independence. Your ancestors had to fight over and over and over. Nowadays, for the most part, we don't have to risk big sacrifices. It's a matter of small sacrifices, some convenience that you don't get. Uh, 
something that you could do if you ran a non-free program, but of course you won't do that, so you don't get it. Uh, we can do that sort of thing. We've got to learn to have a little bit of courage so we can accept a little bit of sacrifice to maintain our freedom. How can you help? Well, if you're a programmer, write free software. Contribute to existing free programs first. When you're good at it, start new ones. But if you don't program at all, you can, become, you can be an activist. You can organize a free software activist group and spread the ideas about freedom. Teach other people to, to value and campaign for freedom. You can persuade schools and governments to move to free software. You can help other users. If you're an expert user, if you're good at helping others get what they need, then you can participate in a GNU slash Linux users group. And above all, by insisting on saying free software, not something that doesn't stand for freedom, you're helping the cause. So <clears throat> that is one of the threats to our freedom, that is non-free software. But there are various other threats. For instance, surveillance. Digital technology made possible a giant increase in surveillance of everyone. We are subject to far more surveillance now than the former Soviet Union. And it's increasing. And this threatens democracy. Some of the surveillance is done directly by the state. When, they, when it sets up cameras to watch everyone, to recognize people's faces or the backs of their heads, to recognize license, camera, license plates, we need laws to stop these practices from being done. <clears throat> it should be a law that a system that remains in a place and can recognize or follow individuals or cars may only be set up when authorized in a specific place by a court for a specific amount of time. <clears throat> that is when it's looking at a public place. If it's looking at the inside of your apartment, that doesn't have to be anybody's business but yours. <clears throat> We have to recognize, for instance, that we want security cameras instead of surveillance cameras. What's the difference? A security camera makes a local recording physically and can't be accessed, uh, the data can't be accessed except by going there and taking it out. For discouraging crime, that's perfectly adequate. When there's a crime, someone can go and get that recording but it's not suitable for letting someone watch everybody all the time. It's too hard to go and collect those recordings. They won't do it. So it gives us security without oppression. But once that camera is connected to the internet, it's a recipe for oppression. It's easy for something to watch thousands of those cameras all the time, save it forever, correlate it, that leads to tyranny. We must not permit it. In the US now, they're flying small planes with a camera that can watch a whole city so accurately that every person can be tracked. This is tyranny threatening my country, but ultimately yours as well. Sometimes the surveillance is done by companies. But that doesn't change very much, really, because whatever data the companies accumulate, Big Brother can look at. All it takes is one terrorist attack to give a government an excuse to wipe out human rights. In France, they're now talking about changing the Constitution to make everyone vulnerable to total surveillance forever. Now, a sober people would say, that's more scary than terrorists. Don't do it. Maybe the Swiss are so sober, but don't leave it to chance. Organize it now. Raise the issue. 
strength and resistance now. <clears throat> we need to make internet purchasing anonymous. We need to make it impossible and Ill if that can't be done, then illegal for companies to collect the amounts of data they collect now. Of course, sometimes they collect the data from proprietary software. By insisting on free software, we can protect ourselves against one surveillance mechanism, which is using our own computers to surveil us. But when the surveillance is done in other ways, through systems that don't belong to us, then we can't protect ourselves so easily. In those cases, we need to organize politically to stop the surveillance. Look at gnu.org slash philosophy slash surveillance vs democracy dot html. <clears throat> the reason this threatens democracy is, democracy means the people control the state, which requires that we know what the state is doing. But states tend to keep that secret. How do we find out? We depend on heroes whistleblowers like Edward Snowden to tell us what the state is really doing. Without them, we lose control of the state and it can turn on us. We need the state to be powerful or it can't do its job. But therefore, we need to keep it firmly under our control so it doesn't attack us or betray us to the plutocrats. So, we need to maintain solid democracy. But the state that tries to keep secrets calls the whistleblowers criminals and tries to put them in prison. If the state can identify them, then it can imprison them. If it requires the special knowledge and careful planning of a Snowden to be a whistleblower and not be imprisoned, we won't have enough whistleblowers. Therefore, we must not permit the state to know who goes where and who speaks with whom. If the state can get that much information about the people, it can imprison any whistleblower. In other words, it can always find journalists' sources and imprison them. We must make sure it can't do that. So in that page, surveillance vs democracy.html, you'll find various recommended ways to reduce surveillance. Another threat to our freedom is censorship. <clears throat> we thought 20 years ago that the internet would destroy censorship. It would be too hard to censor the internet. Now we know that's not so. Any government that's willing to tolerate a certain amount of resentment and spend some money can censor the internet. And it's not just obvious tyrannies such as China and Iran that censor the internet. Even countries that claim to be free, such as Finland, censor the internet. Finland imposed internet censorship in 2006, requiring ISPs to block access to sites that were labeled as pornography. Somebody decided to do some, to study the actual practices of censorship in Finland. He found a list of sites that perhaps were censored. And then he tried to access them and he recorded which ones were blocked. He published this and they blocked access to his site. <laughs> the law didn't say that it authorized blocking access to journalistic sites, so he sued and the Finnish Supreme Court a couple of years ago ruled that his site could be blocked. His site is still there. You can get to it from here, you just can't get to it from Finland. It's only the, the victims of Finnish censorship that are not allowed access to information about how they're being censored. <clears throat> he hasn't updated the site. Today it still has the information about Finnish censorship from 2007 when he did this. 
But it proves the point. There is almost no government you can trust not to try to censor the internet. And once there is censorship, it's easy to have more censorship. Switzerland is now faced with a threat of mandatory internet censorship. In any case, there are many countries that have censorship like that, uh, mandatory filters. Several years ago, the first sign that President Erdogan of Turkey was turning into a dictator was when he made every Turkish internet subscriber choose between censorship and more censorship, and yet more censorship and even more censorship. Four levels of censorship, but access to the real internet would not be allowed in Turkey anymore. Bravo to the Turks who protested on the street against this, but the government ignored them. More recently, the United Kingdom did the same kind of thing. There are two levels of censorship. By default, everything is on the higher level of more censorship. If you have your own line, you can request, request less censorship. But if you're not wealthy enough to have your own line and you have to use public access, you're stuck with more censorship. In Australia, they don't have mandatory filters. It's been defeated so far, but instead they have censorship of links. There are links that you're not, there are sites you're not allowed to link to. Electronic Frontier Australia, which defends human rights in Australia, was ordered to remove a link to a foreign political website on pain of a fine of $11,000 a day. What was this website? No, it was not a terrorist website. It was something approximately as disgusting. It was an anti-abortion rights website, uh, the kind of people who are trying to kill women. But they have a right to present their views. Even in Australia, it's wrong to censor views no matter how disgusting those view we find those views. F respecting freedom of speech re means respecting the right to say the things we strongly disagree with. In India, there's tremendous censorship. Uh, not only materials on the internet, but books and films are censored if they are considered to offend somebody's religion. Uh, the brilliant animated film Sita Sings the Blues is banned in India. Uh, a book about oppression of Hindus in Bangladesh was banned, at least in West Bengal. Uh, a comedian was recently arrested for mocking a religious leader. And anything on the internet in India that is de accused of offending some religion can be removed without even a trial. So censorship is a growing threat around the world and we must oppose any proposal to censor. <clears throat> Threats come from the use of internet servers. I already told you about two of them. I told you about the non-free JavaScript code sent in web pages, and I told you about service as a software substitute. Another one is that internet services collect a lot of data about people. Now, sometimes they do it through surveillance in a sneaky way. You know that Facebook collects a lot of data from its used Facebook does not have users, it has useds. Are those windows really open fully? Can we move the, maybe we should move the, uh, sh the curtains so air flows better. Uh, it's really important, I'm afraid. Oh, thank you. Um, if you see a like button, Facebook knows that your computer has visited that page. The reason is the, the image of the like button and some JavaScript code comes from the Facebook server. The Facebook server sends it to your machine by its IP address. And it knows what page you're look, 
looking at because the protocol tells it that is the browser sends the information I want this image for the sake of such and such page so the Facebook server knows the machine with this IP address visited that page it's getting data about you even if you were never a used of Facebook yourself but not with our browser IceCat because we've made it block all those things <clears throat> IceCat is a variant of Firefox in which we've adopted protecting the user's privacy as our goal so there are things most browsers uh, do certain things to please website developers where we decide to serve the user instead but in addition to the surveillance they do <clears throat> they also ask for a lot of data and in this case it's not sneaky or hidden but it's still collecting people's data and it's still dangerous we need to be able to say no in fact I always say no uh, I don't use those kinds of disservices but in addition there are services that offer to hold your data for you and unless you're very careful that's surveillance of you you mustn't use those and this is now getting incorporated into mobile devices they're being set up to store their data on some company's server well you can't trust that except in one special case if you encrypt all the data with free software on your own machine if you make an archive containing all the files and then you encrypt the archive with free software on your own machine with a free program you installed in your own machine not JavaScript code sent by a, a web server but a program you installed then you can upload that archive anywhere and no one can see what's inside it so that's a good service could be a useful extra backup to make in case your machine is lost or something but anything less you should not trust <clears throat> so is the, um, what is it possible to ask some questions not yet I'm not done okay okay I have a few more threats to cover you know probably going to be another half hour or so <clears throat> if you if you didn't understand my words if you want clarification of the meaning of what I said please ask immediately but if it's just a question about the subject please save it to the end but I would like some more water if I could have some more water with no gas I would just get it from the faucet you see good it's it's bottled water I'm very sorry although I, I can't drink bubbled water it's, it's bottled, no, bottled bottle okay well I won't reject it as long as it's not from coca-cola company <laughs> there's a worldwide boycott of coca-cola company for murdering union organizers in Colombia thank you so another threat comes from the use of computers for voting you can't trust them because you can't be sure what they're doing the idea of voting systems is to resist fraud so traditional voting systems are designed so that every aspect is being watched except when the voter marks the ballot but aside from that everything that goes on is being watched by various people so that it's hard for anyone to get away with fraud and they're not so complicated that you couldn't understand it 
anyone of ordinary intelligence can learn to understand what the voting procedure should, like, should look like and what fraud would look like. And parties train people to be poll watchers, so that they, which means just to go and check for fraud. But once a computer is involved, only an expert can possibly check it to see if it's honest. And the expert requires special access to even try. And it's still not enough because you don't know that someone didn't install the wrong program this morning, which will count the votes wrong and commit fraud, and then plans to reinstall the correct program tonight and remove all traces. That's another thing. With computerized voting, often there is no way to do a recount. There's no way to audit the results to make sure they're correct. And inside the computer, it's just as easy to do a big fraud as a small fraud. On paper, the bigger the fraud, the more work it is, the more, vis more chances to see it, the less chance of getting away with it. But inside the computer, it's as easy to change the amount by uh, 1,024 as it is to change it by one. It's just a different bit that you change. So using computers is asking for trouble. People are trying, are doing research, trying to develop schemes for automated voting where they can, uh, where encryption is used to somehow make it impossible to commit fraud. Maybe eventually one of those will work. I don't want my city to be the guinea pig to find out if it really is reliable. And besides, just because the scheme in the abstract can't be broken, that doesn't mean it's safe in practice. The real system is bigger than the theoretical system. Here's an example from uh, 2012, I think it was, in the US. Or maybe it was 2014. Uh, some computerized voting machines were used, and after the voter said, I'm done, in a few seconds, another screen would come up saying, you voted for these people, is this correct? Yes or no? Well, often the voter was already gone and didn't see this. So somebody working in the polls walked around and went into those empty voting booths and pushed on that and said no and changed the votes and finalized it. Uh, you see, the surface that can be attacked is bigger than you might think. That one, that person was caught. Uh, how many others were not caught, we don't know. So I'm talking here about machines in the polling place for counting, computers for counting the votes. Another problem with them is that uh, their display screens may be visible outside the building. <clears throat> and if there are not a lot of voters, if there's only one person voting at a time and they can see how, what's on the screen, they can tell how each person voted. And this has really been done demonstrated by researchers. So uh, you can't trust those, but internet voting is even worse. The server's security probably isn't all that good and could be broken. And then there's the security of the user's own machine. If the user's own machine is a zombie, well, then the botnet will decide that user's real vote. It'll, it'll say, you're vo yes, you're voting for A, and real it'll send a vote for B. <clears throat> but uh, in addition, there's always the danger that your uh, threatening spouse or employer will demand that you vote in his presence and so he can check that you voted for the right person. 
and no one knows any way to resist that. So we shouldn't allow remote voting. It's a foolish idea, except when there's a special justification, such as you're going to be out of town. Estonia uses internet voting a lot and claims to have done this in a very secure way. A team from the US investigated their practices, pointing out that the adversary in this case is not some bunch of students trying to have fun, nor a criminal gang, it's Russia's internet army. And pointed out that Estonia's election system cannot, is, is doing things too wrong and could not resist this kind of attack. It's simply a foolish thing to even tr talk about doing. Another threat to our freedom comes, oh, and there's a page on stallman.org with information about various cases of known problems and flaws in internet voting. We think that W, or well not just, sorry, with computerized voting of any kind, uh, it looked like W stole the 2004 presidential election through uh, fiddling with, uh, vote with optical vote counting machines in the state of Ohio. There was a, pa a consistent pattern in the counties where they counted votes by hand, the outcome agreed with the exit polls. But in the counties where they counted votes by machine, there was a systematic difference in favor of W between the actual outcome and the exit polls. So maybe the US presidency was stolen this way. Another threat to our freedom in the digital society comes from the war on sharing. Digital technology is so useful because it makes it easier to copy and manipulate information and to transmit it. Uh, there are those that don't want us to get this benefit, who want to have control over what we do with our computers, namely the copyright industry. For decades now, they've been waging a war on users to try to stop us from having full use and full control of our technology. They started with propaganda. They called the people who share pirates, presuming, taking for granted, that cooperating with other people is the moral equivalent of attacking ships. Morally speaking, that's as false as can be because attacking ships is very bad, uh, but sharing with other people is good. Fortunately, there is no piracy in Switzerland. Where would it be on Lac Le Mans? So I reject their propaganda. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad, let's send the Navy. <laughs> if they ask me what I think of movie piracy, I say I like the first Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> if they had only, if they had limited themselves to propaganda, I wouldn't call it a war because they have the right to express their views. But they didn't stop there. Then they began perverting our technology, perverting the products that we get so that instead of serving us, they restrict us for the sake of the lords of copyright. That's digital restrictions management, DRM. They put them into computers and into proprietary software. But hackers found ways to break the handcuffs. By the way, hacking means playful cleverness. Uh, when people break security on a computer, we refer to them as crackers. Their activity is cracking, which is distinguished from hacking. 
<clears throat> so they developed new methods that were harder to break, but they also imposed unjust laws prohibiting the distribution of devices that can break DRM. This started in the US with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, the worst part of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is the part that makes it a crime to distribute anything to, that can break DRM unless it has another commercially important use. Important for culture, not good enough. Important for human rights, not good enough. Important for education, not good enough. Only commercial importance is considered valid. Now this demonstrates that in passing that law, they sold out to business. But people kept on finding ways to break DRM until it got even harder. Streaming makes it incredibly hard. In principle, it might be possible to figure out how to break the DRM of a streaming service. The problem is they probably have 10 more variants ready to release at a moment's notice. If, anybody, if they find out that somebody broke the DRM of version 38, they'll release version 39 which means it's basically hopeless to defeat their handcuffs that way. But they didn't stop with that. People started sharing works peer-to-peer -peer on the internet. So proposals were made to attack people for sharing. In some countries, they have abolished the basic principle of justice no punishment without a fair trial. And they punish people on mere accusation of sharing. For instance, the UK, uh, New Zealand, Australia, Panama, and the US tried to impose it on Colombia, but the Supreme Court objected to the laws that were adopted. So they're still trying to do it. In the US, it would be unconstitutional to punish people without, an ex without at least a pretense of a fair trial. So Obama arranged a voluntary agreement between the major US ISPs and uh, the publishers where the ISPs agree to punish their own customers and eventually help the, uh, the, the uh, publishers sue their customers. Suing their customers is something that they've done anyway, and they sue, they've sued thousands of teenagers for hundreds of thousands of dollars each, which is a very nasty thing to do, but they're going even further than that. In Japan, to download something from the internet is a crime punished by two years in prison. Any copy of anything without authorization, two years in prison. Of course, they will only do this when some really important publisher demands it. And if two years isn't enough, I suppose they'll start uh, shooting people dead uh, with a firing squad because in their war on sharing they will go to whatever lengths they find necessary to maintain their dominion over people. Now because they are such they're such uh, unreconcilable enemies of our freedom I never use anything with DRM unless I have what is needed to break the DRM. I hope you will adopt that same policy too. So if you have the free software to uh, decrypt the video on a DVD, then by all means use DVDs. But never accept a product whose purpose is to deny your freedom.
So it's no coincidence that they keep using ever nastier methods. You see, sharing is good, and with digital technology, sharing is easy, so people share. And the only way to stop people from sharing is with cruel, draconian measures. So they do something nastier and nastier and nastier until it works for a while. We have to put an end to this entirely. We must end the war on sharing by legalizing sharing explicitly, saying everyone has the right to share copies. Now, sharing means non-commercial redistribution of exact copies. It would, be, it would be limited to that. It's all right to have a copyright system applying to commercial redistribution or modification, except for things like software, which should be free but for music and videos and fiction, it's all right to have that copyright system. Sharing is the right that we absolutely need to have. So <clears throat> the publishers say, this is horrible, you'd be stealing from the artists. That's nonsense. The publishers are the ones who steal from the artists. <laughs> they don't leave very much. Or they say, how are we going to compensate the artists? Compensate for what? If you hire some musicians to play at your party and they do it, then you have to pay them. That's compensating artists when they do work for you. But that's the only case where you owe them compensation. If you hear the song, that doesn't mean you owe them money. There's no, you haven't done them harm, you don't owe them anything, and they don't deserve any compensation for that. We must reject uh, the idea that we have a debt to, a specific debt to an artist because we appreciated a work. Next thing you know, they'll be uh, requiring museums to pay for permission to let people in. <clears throat> And another swindle is when they talk about compensating the rights holders, because we're supposed to think that means the artists, but really it means the publishers. So they can swindle us into accepting policies designed to keep up the publisher's income, and we were fooled into thinking we were supporting artists. I am in favor of supporting artists more. That's useful. If we want arts, we should support artists. But we must do this in a 21st century way, one that is designed to be compatible with legalizing sharing. So I have two proposals to make. One, number one works through the state. The state collects some money each year to divide among artists based on their popularity. It'll have to compute their popularity or measure it by polling or something like that. Once you've got a popularity figure for each artist, how much money should that artist get? The obvious way is linear proportion. Twice as popular, twice as much money. If A is a thousand times as popular, because A is a star, then appreciated, capable, non-star B, then A would get a thousand times as much money as B which means the money would be wasted. It would mostly, almost all of it would go to a few stars. Not, not a useful system to adopt if, we go, if our goal is to support the arts better. The stars don't need more money and the rest wouldn't get any significant amount from this. So I propose take the cube root of the popularity of each artist <coughs> and distribute in proportion to that. The cube root of a thousand is ten. If A is a thousand times as popular as B, then with the cube root, A would get ten times as much money as B. Not a thousand times, just ten. So the effect of the cube root is to, take, to shift most of the money from the stars to the mid-range popularity artists where more support will help the arts. Those are the artists that could use the chance not to have a day job and might get it with this system. Now, the cube root keeps going up. It never goes down. 
keeps going up. So the more popular you are, the more money you'll get. A star will get more money than a non-star, but not thousands of times as much as a non-star. So that's what will make this system efficient, use our money efficiently to support the arts. My, the other method is voluntary payments. <clears throat> Suppose each player has a button you can push to send a little bit of money to the artists. Like maybe a, maybe a quarter of a franc in Switzerland. There's some optimal amount, right? If the amount is too small, maybe everybody will push it and it will add up to very little. If the amount is too big, a lot of people won't push it. There's got to be some amount that maximizes the total that people send every day. An economist maybe could figure it out. I could only guess. It doesn't matter. It will be worked out. The point is, then once this is there and it should send it anonymously, you can either push it or not. It's totally up to you. If you don't push it, nobody will pester you. But if you do push it, you'll feel good. So people who can afford it will push it, and poor people won't. That's very important. Poor people shouldn't have to pay. We shouldn't try to squeeze money out of poor people to support arts. We should invite the non-poor to support arts and make it so easy that how could they say no? How could they resist feeling good that they sent something to the artist? Voluntary payments work pretty well already, in fact. That's what crowdfunding is. Contribute some money and they'll do this project. It funds substantial artistic projects. The comedian Louis C.K. decided to crowdfund recording of his project, of his next tour, and he got so much money it covered all the expenses. There was the humble ebook bundle. A few years ago, several well known science fiction writers decided to publish a bunch of ebooks on saying, download it if you like and pay if you like. They got a million dollars in a month. That's equivalent to being on the New York Times bestseller list, all of them. <clears throat> so, voluntary payments work even when they're bigger. But the smaller the payment is, the more people will join in sending it. Of course, there can be various schemes for voluntary payments. Artists already have their schemes saying, please donate if you like. Oh, and if you send me $50, I'll send you this nice token of my appreciation. If you send me $1,000, I'll have dinner with you. Uh, well, now, in addition, there will be the button on the player program. So... So, there's one more... Question? But before I move on, perhaps now is the best time for me to tell you that the government of Switzerland is planning to surrender to the aristocrats' army this time. They're coming to, f to conquer you again. Not, but not literally with an army. This time what they want to do is impose cruel and unjust copyright rules. The war on sharing is still going on. They're proposing mandatory internet filtering for Switzerland. They want to be, be able to require ISPs to block access to sites in the name of copyright. And they want to impose the DMCA's takedown system, but even worse. The DMCA is a US law, and the takedown system means if there's a platform where people post things, someone else can say, that posting infringes my copyright, and the platform has to take it down, even if the accusation is false. And it has to stay down, I think it's for 10 days, even if they know the accusation is false. But 
they were threatening Google so much that Google set up something called Content ID, where every some time something new is posted, Google checks it, trying to see if it matches anything anybody ever complained about before, and then blocks it automatically. But it's unreliable. It makes mistakes. Things get blocked wrongly. Uh, and then people complain about this a lot. And I, don't, I suppose that only big companies like Google are in a position to even do a thing like this. But in Switzerland, they're proposing to make content ID required for all platforms. So if you're small, don't think about running a platform for people to post on. And then <clears throat> they're planning to make libraries pay for permission to lend books as if libraries were, were not under enough pressure already. And they're planning to make ISPs uh, reveal the identities of their users so that uh, Hollywood companies can sue them. And after talking so much about bowing down, to how we need to cater so much to the authors and artists, on one point they want to dismiss us all and ignore what we've said we want, and that is when we, when we release a work under a license that says you're allowed to redistribute this in certain ways, for instance, any of the Creative Commons licenses, they're creating an excuse to ignore the conditions of those licenses. Basically, they want to allow collecting societies to give a blanket license for everything, like, you know, all books, or all videos, or all music, or anything like that. And they would give these blanket licenses to big companies, and then those companies would be allowed to use anything, and the only condition would be to pay. Of course, theoretically, the copyright holders in this case, it probably would be the authors, could tell the collecting society not to do this, but they'd have to know it was going on, and they'd have to find out where it was, and they're probably not in this country. They could be anywhere around the world. What if 50 countries did this every time you publish something and you said, uh, modified versions must be under this license, and you want that to be obeyed, you're going to have to write to 50 collecting societies through the ways each one of them said to do it. This is ridiculous. Every, there are a few minor good things in that proposed law, but they could be done by themselves. They're not an excuse for these bad things, so there's a consultation going on until March. It's vital to respond saying, don't do this. It's wrong to call sharing piracy. It's wrong to bow down to foreign demands like this. So we are planning, actually? We are planning to make a response to this copyright revision. OK, but is it only, is it only organizations that can respond, or can individuals too? Anyone, anyone. OK, so all of you should do it. And each of you should post your response, because they might not post responses that they don't like. So you post it. Or maybe you can post everybody's responses. So we are planning to do this. Um, it's a Urheberrechtsrevision. Um, and we are planning to do uh, uh, answer by the parliamentarian group. So we are collecting mm -hmm. opinions if you want to. Will you post people's responses? I can, yes. Uh, will this organization post them? We have can a blog. Can they send them yeah. to you? Yes, we have a blog. You can send them by email and we post it on the blog. Oh, they will? That's yeah. good.
uh, or when we talk about censorship, there is, there is already a law passing the parliament in the next months about uh, online gaming. And there is also an article planning censorship. But that's about online gaming. So uh, I think many laws, not only uh, intellectual there property, are a lot of, oh, there are many laws coming now property. which implement yeah. censorship explicitly. Mm -hmm. So uh, By the way, it's a mistake that. to use the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, because it lumps together laws that are totally different. For instance, copyright law and patent law are totally different. Every aspect is different between those two laws. You can't treat them as if they were one issue. But that term invites people to, to generalize where it's a mistake to generalize. So since I realized that, which is about 12 years ago, I have never used the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote. I'll talk about copyright, or I'll talk about patents, or I'll talk about trademark law, or I'll talk about uh, appellation contrôlée, or I'll talk, you know, whichever law it is, if I know anything about it, I could say something, but I will never use the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, because that term spreads confusion. We, to understand these laws, we need to keep them separate in our minds. In any case, there's another threat to our freedom in the digital society. I'm sorry, but unless you tell me we need to leave now, I want to tell people the whole thing, and this is, this is faster than usual. This is less than two hours so far. I'm finishing pretty fast, you know. You asked for a topic that usually takes two, two hours. So the last threat to our freedom is that it, we don't have the right to actually do anything in the internet. For instance, if there's some position you want to state to people, you can write it on a piece of paper and walk around the street carrying it. You don't need to get a company to let you do that. You have a right to do that. But if you want to do that on the internet, through a website, you need the cooperation of an ISP and a domain name registry and a hosting company. And they can cut off their, their services arbitrarily in practice because each one writes terms of service and then that company interprets those terms of service and d judges whether you violated them and can cut you off. Most of them say they can change their terms of service at any time and if you go on using their service after they announce the change, you've accepted it. Now, I don't know how it is here, but in Boston, if you rent an apartment, you sign a lease. And there are laws about what, those, what leases are allowed to require. If the landlord puts in something that the law doesn't allow, it's void. The landlord can't judge whether you violated the lease either. Even if the landlord has a valid complaint, such as if you didn't pay your rent, the landlord can't just kick you out. The landlord can go to court and present the evidence that you didn't carry out your side of the, re of the agreement. And if you didn't pay your rent and you can't justify it in some way, like a rent strike, then the landlord can get an order and get you kicked, evicted, but the landlord doesn't get to decide. This is what it means to have some rights. But in the internet, as of yet, we don't have rights. Important kinds of internet services that people in general need must not be allowed to choose their own terms of service, nor to interpret them. One more minute. Sorry, why are you rushing me? <laughs> now, we saw how bad this could get when the US decided to kick WikiLeaks off the internet extrajudicially, not by a prosecution. Apparently, WikiLeaks had not br broken any laws and there was nothing to prosecute. But instead, officials began intimidating companies that were providing services to WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks had rented an Amazon virtual server. After intimidation, Amazon reinterpreted its terms of service to say that publishing leaks was not allowed. 
<coughs> and, and pulled the plug on the virtual server. Then it attacked some domain names and eliminated them, but fortunately the US couldn't eliminate WikiLeaks.ch. And then... Post Finance tried to. What? Post Finance, the Swiss Postal Bank, they cut his account in Switzerland. Cut which account? Julian Assange. Oh, Assange, but not, but not WikiLeaks.ch. This is, this is, I'm talking about the domain name that makes it possible to type in wikileaks.ch and get connected to the server that WikiLeaks puts there. That's what the US was trying to block. But then it tried to block payments for people to donate to WikiLeaks. And a long series of companies just announced arbitrarily they wouldn't send money to WikiLeaks. They would not obey their customers' requests even Visa and MasterCard. Then a company in Iceland, which was accepting credit card payments for its services, said it would accept also donations to WikiLeaks. They cut off credit card processing to the company. And then European U Union law came into play. Uh, it ap apparently applies to some extent to Iceland. And it says that because Visa and MasterCard have a large market share, they're not allowed to arbitrarily cut off service. The company sued and it won. It forced them to reestablish its service and even to give money to donate to WikiLeaks. This was the beginning of a sign of what we really need. We've got to make it impossible to intimidate these services into cutting off something controversial. So I think this is a very good closing sentence. <laughs> now it's time for the auction. Okay, so please give an applause uh, for the...